cutting on your time. And by all the great barbecue products and supplies at the Owl's Nest Barbecue Supply and Pro Shop. I know you've got questions, and we've got answers. So pick up the phone, 423-267-1023, and let's talk some barbecue. Hey, that's right. Hey, welcome that's right. to the weekend, and welcome to the barbecue show, the Owl's Nest Barbecue Show, live right here on Talk Radio 102.3. Simulcast on the Owl's Nest Barbecue Facebook page. Hey, our number is 423-267-1023. 423-267-1023. Get off your lazy butt and give us a call and we'll talk barbecue tonight. We've got a jam-packed show for you tonight. Uh, broadcast partner, as always, is Backyard Smokers Barbecue. And we are now associated with Proudly. The Dead Broke Barbecue Network on YouTube. Jeff Rice and all his buddies, the creator of Dead Broke Barbecue. Check it out on YouTube. You'll be glad you did. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, Ryan is here. Joe is here. Jeff is here. Steve Ray is here. 267 Okay, I covered all the bases. Um, what a day. What a day, Jeff. Jeff and I just, we came up to do the show here at the Owl's Nest Barbecue Live Studios, we have got a 140-pound hog on our Carolina pig cooker right now. And, Jeff, it is, it's amazing. That is a beautiful-looking animal. It, well, it's, it's, it's with Elvis now, as they say, but it's, yeah. we're getting, it's, it's getting cooked. She's and looking pretty. It's looking good. We checked it right before we came up. And the uh, Carolina pig cooker is doing just a fantastic job. So, um you can go to the, our uh, face the Owls Nest Barbecue Facebook page. There's a video of us prepping it. If you want to do that, and just you know check it out. Uh, the the um, hey Steve, what's new in barbecue segment? Brought to you tonight by the new Urban Slicer White and Red Pizza Mojo seasoning, a sublime seasoning. I've always wondered what that word was, what it meant. Sublime, a few a new product available at the Owls Nest Barbecue Supply. In Ultawa, the Urban Slicer White and Red Pizza Mojo Seasoning, a sublime seasoning. Of course, the biggest thing going on in our barbecue lives right now is the big Hoptown Beer Bar anniversary going on tomorrow. It starts at noon, featuring a whole hog pig roast by none other than us, the Owl's Nest Barbecue Team. Ryan Hargrove, the owner of the Hoptown Beer Bar, was nice enough to have a, invite us over, and we are going to not let him down. Uh, our our special guest pit master tomorrow is Jeff Eversall from Walmart, and he will be assisted by his wife, Denise, and they will be assisted by the Owls Nest Barbecue team. So we have a lot of people cooking this hog just for you so it doesn't get screwed up. Now, this is what you're going to get tomorrow because you can come out at noon and you can buy a plate. This is, this is, how, this is how we take care of you. Uh, each plate is going to be $15, and this is what you're going to get. You're going to get a big pulled pork sandwich. You're going to get a bag of Lay's potato chips. You're going to get a, si a side of, of Jennifer's famous baked beans. And you're going to get a side of Gen Jennifer's famous mac and cheese. And you're going to get a little Debbie brownie. And you're going to get a drink. All of that for $15. Seriously, two people could probably eat off of one box. So come on out to uh, Hoptown Beer Bar tomorrow. And we will um, see you out there with our whole hog, with the whole hog cooker. Just follow your nose, as they say. Uh, also, we are waiting on the new Royal Oak charcoal pellets. I thought they would be here by there. Did they come in? Aaron says he worked today. He said they did not come in. But they should be here any day. Now, I know everybody, a lot of people are waiting on them. This is the biggest technological breakthrough since Neil Armstrong took that first step on the moon and uttered those famous words, man, I hope this thing starts back up. Royal Oak, real charcoal pellets. They are, they are a thing, and they are on their way to the Owl's Nest Barbecue store. All right, got that note down. All right, we're going to invite, in, we're going to announce our new guest right now, all the way from Ultawa, one of the longest running establishments at Cambridge Square the purveyor of the Hoptown Beer Bar himself. Aaron? That's right. Mr. Ryan Hargrove of the Hoptown Beer Bar at Cambridge Square in Ottawa celebrating 
six years of keeping the thirsty people in Udawa happy. Ryan, what's up, buddy? Hey, how you doing, man? I'm that's good. A, how you doing? A very a nice introduction. I like that. Well, you you deserve it. You're, I guess, Ryan, you're the uh, the longest tenant, the long the longest business at Cambridge Square, probably. So, uh, so Southern Burger and Loopy's were there a short time before us, mm-hmm. and then uh, we we opened. And then a week later, wind down opened, and of course they're all you know all those businesses are still there as well. But yeah, six years, man, it's been it's been a wild like you know especially you, you know, know, you know I remember I remember when they time. announced when you announced that you were going to open a a craft beer place. Everybody got so excited, and uh, you know the the momentum has built, and uh, from day one. Uh, you go by there, especially in the spring, summer when you've got those big garage doors open, and the um, you know the store just it kind of flows out into the square, uh, just a wonderful setting. Well, tell me about when you before we talk about the big anniversary party, Mark. Tell me about how you de- how you design that and what you design that after. Well, now looking at it these days, I wish we would have uh, gotten a bigger location because it's a little uh, you know we're just a small little little one thousand square foot spot. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's, it's nice on, on certain days and certain nights. We kind of have like a cozy, relaxing atmosphere with the small, you know, with a small spot. Um, but how we, we designed it, we designed it that way just to be, you know, we don't want to, we didn't want a huge four or 5,000 square foot place that even if it was packed, it looked empty. You know, we like yeah. to have the, we like to have a, a smaller spot, um, relaxing atmosphere. You know, we like people to, you know, put their phones down, not watch TV, talk to each other, talk to each other about life and talk to each other about beer. And, you know, we did de- that's, we designed it that way on purpose. Um, and, you know, again, on a busy, on a busy Friday night, Saturday afternoon, sure. We wish we were a little bit bigger, but you know, that's, that may be, that may be some news that we have in the future, um, coming up shortly. So, well, I'm going to we'll, tell, uh, I'm gonna tell everybody right now, Ryan is being very humble. That place busts at the seams on these pretty days I've been by there. And uh, the people sitting at that long bar inside, Ryan, then the, uh, they pour out onto the little uh, patio area that you have. And then in the main in the main uh, lobby there, people just uh, just uh, standing around and, um, you know, sampling. You know, I'm, you got those flights and, and uh, you know, sampling the different craft beers you got. How do you, um, how do you decide which one to put in there? That's got to be a tough decision. Well, you know, it's crazy. A lot of people ask me that. They ask if I, if I try everything we get. And the answer to that is no. I don't really have, I don't really have time to, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I don't, I don't have time to try everything that we, that we bring in. I do a little bit of research and, and, uh, you know, look online just to see what, um, what styles are, are, are popular at the time. And, and I mean, essentially I just look and see what, you know, what, what sounds good to me. And you know, it might it, there may be some things that we that we get that we'll that we'll never get again. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not usually that's not usually the case. I do I'll have to pat myself on the back a lot for. I I honestly am I'm very biased with this, but I think that when even when my wife and I want to go out for a beer and I and I ask her, you know, where do we want to go? And you know, sometimes I don't want to go to work, um, but we find ourselves at the best place that we think has the best selection of anywhere in Chattanooga. And I honestly feel like that's at hop town. It's your play. Um, I, I agree I, with that a hundred percent. I know I'm, I know I'm biased, but, um, you know, and, and, and there's no, you know, I love lots of other small businesses that we have around the city and some of them even belong to some friends of mine. Um, but just looking at an overall, selection for someone for the you know for people that you know for everyone you know there there may be some things that we have that 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 i don't like but i found out in the very beginning that that's not what it's all about it's about you have to have something for everyone because my goal is that if somebody's walking through that door they're getting something no matter what it is i'm gonna i'm gonna get them something that day hey let's talk about the big uh, uh let's talk about the big party tomorrow starts at noon 
Um, tell me what yes, you're. Sir. Tell me what you're going to have, and then I'll tell you what we're going to have. <clears throat> so what we've got, um, starting at actually twelve thirty and going to three thirty, um, we've got some live music from a guy named Daniel Schmidt. Um, mm-hmm. I actually met him at Southside Social a couple months ago. We were just there hanging out, and um, the music he was playing there just was it was awesome. And I went up to him and asked him for a card and and he was available tomorrow so he'll be there um he ends at 3 30 there is more live music on the square mm-hmm. at seven o'clock at seven o'clock um and and people can you know grab a beer from us and take it out to the square and go check out the um check out that live music i've got several several beers that we've been kind of i call it hoarding like i've had i've had some kegs that i've i've kept for this pretty much this special weekend i've Mm -hmm. had some that i've kept for over a year just knowing that this is something special uh this is something i want to share with people this is not just a beer that we'll just tap to to um um, you know any other day so we've got uh lots of good beer that we're going to have on tap and and also not just on tap but in some cans uh and i'll have to give a quick shout out to some um a brewery that's here in chattanooga odd story brewing company made some amazing um, some amazing cans for us just for our anniversary this oh, weekend, good. and they're uh, they're really they're really good friends of ours. Uh, All right, also, gonna... we've got. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, you go ahead. Oh, uh, we've got. Um, in addition to the food you're bringing, we've got some um, amazing. Uh, we keep them all the time. Some spent grain pretzels that we're doing tomorrow that are. Um, uh, we always have, but we're doing a really good deal on those, and. Yeah, man, just a just a big, a good time with a lot of good friends and good people, good vibes, and that's what we're looking forward to. Well, we're going to be there with a with a pig roast going on, our whole hog. We're going to have it on the hog cooker, serving it right that's off. That's what the, I'm excited ser, Serving right off the hog, and um, we're looking forward to servicing all your customers and our customers, Ryan. And I'm going to tell you something: you just don't realize what a big pleasure and an honor it is to uh, be teaming up with you um this is something i've always wanted to do you know i've always wanted to do something down down at your place and uh this is going to be a lot of fun and hopefully maybe it'll even kick off something that we can make a, a semi annual thing going on 100 percent. i'm i'm very excited about just this just this event and i would love to i was talking to my wife about that i would love to do something you know similar to this you know, absolutely not just not just once a year, but we could do this more often. You know, and it, it doesn't even have to be a whole hog; it just could be, you know, just some some good barbecue. Good old barbecue, the, we can do that you're, too. You're the master, all that good stuff. Well, good deal. All right, man, we got to run, Ryan. Thank you so much, and we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, we'll sir, be down there really it. early, Very and much. I know you will be too. And we'll we'll hook up and talk some more tomorrow. Okay, Ryan Hargrove. The purveyor of Hoptown Beer Bar in Cambridge Square. Sixth anniversary party tomorrow starts at 12 noon, and we will see him down there. We're going to take our first break. Stay with us here on the Owl's Nest Barbecue Show live on Talk Radio 102.3. We'll be right back. There, Robert. Come on, Robert. Pick up that phone. Pick up that phone, Robert. He didn't hear it ring last time. Pick up that phone, Robert Moss. Pick up that phone. Pick up that phone. Pick up that phone. Call him again, Aaron. Do you have the number? Yeah. I can just yeah. Tap it, in. it is one. Um, hang on. Let's see. Mm, crap. 
um, 843-1843. Okay, 259. Five four zero eight. Hey there, Steve. Hey, Robert. What's up, buddy? Uh, not much. Good deal. Glad you're there. Glad you're there. Yep. We ran over just looking a forward bit. to the oh, nice good. weekend here. Yes, sir. How's the weather in Charleston? Uh, it's pretty good. It's uh, only low 80s today, so not super yeah, hot. It's, so it's great nice. here. It's, we've had some nice non-humidic weather, as they say. Yeah, we had a bunch of rain earlier, but storms came through. But then the last two days have been I'm going to get. To, much, I'm, going to, I'm going to. Get, I'm going to get the radio station to let me do a four-hour show with you one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to bring a snack for that one. We can do that. <laughs> Get a couple, couple barbecue sandwiches. We can do that. What do you think about that picture of that pig I sent you? Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, it looked pretty awesome. Uh, now, when did y'all do that? Today. We, it's on the pit now. Oh, it's on the pit now. Yeah, okay. we we took a break to do the show, and we're heading right back now. All right. <laughs> well, it looked great, man. It's a big old sucker. Remember, put me off of that put, thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there November. I'm going to come November 13th, so make sure... Put me on the alternate list. Oh, definitely will. You know how those superstar, uh, you know how those superstar pig cookers are. They'll they'll, they'll bug out on you. For your free online. Visit. All right, here we go. Just a second. H i m s dot com slash j o y. Talk radio one hundred two point three. Okay, are you okay. a Malcolm Reed fan? Sure, sure you fans. are. Everybody is, and we have the entire lineup of how to barbecue right rubs and sauces at the Owl's Nest. Barbecue supply in Oldowa. Did you see Malcolm use his classic barbecue rub on that pork butt and follow it up with his AP rub? Yeah, I saw it too. And you can get them both at the Owl's Nest Barbecue Supply in Oudowa. Okay, we're going back to the Butcher Barbecue Hotline. And our next guest is... Is... Thank you very much. It's hard finding good free help. All the way from the Low Country in South Carolina, we have barbecue historian Dr. Robert Morris, Mor Robert Moss, author of Barbecue: The History of an American Institution. I'm showing it right now on the Facebook side of the broadcast. I go nowhere without this book, Robert. It is my favorite, favorite <laughs> book. You know, I told you one day. At, at, one day, Jeff, we need to do a four-hour show with Robert. He could definitely fill it. Yeah, we we can talk the history of barbecue from seventeen seventy seven to to today twenty twenty one. We could do the whole. Yeah. We could run four, the whole gamut. Robert. Four hours, my guess, about to the ninth, about to nineteen hundred. We may have to do it six hours. We can we, we do can that. do that. I'll block it off. These guys are always looking for good ideas here at the radio station. Marathon. Hey, before we talk about the history of the um, the Fourth of July and barbecue. Uh, let's talk about the uh, Holy Smokes, the Low Country Barbecue Festival that is coming up on November the 13th. I know it's a little early, but this is this looks like it's going to be a pretty big deal, Robert. Yeah, it certainly is going to be, um, and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of it, helping organize it a little bit. It's going to be here in Charleston, uh, technically in North Charleston, just uh, just up the peninsula from, from downtown, uh, in a place called The Bend which is this gorgeous event space overlooking the Ashley River. Very few places in, in Charleston where you can have an outdoor event overlooking the marsh and the river, and this is, this is going to be one of them. And it's going to be in November, which in Charleston is a great time to be here because the weather is usually very mild mm -hmm. uh, and, and pleasant. And we are inviting pitmasters from all over the country. Um, it's really getting organized by some of the local barbecue restaurateurs here, uh, the guys behind the Home Team Barbecue and Swig and Swine along with uh, Rodney Scott and John Lewis, or t two well-known pitmasters here, will be involved. And then we're going to be uh, announcing the, the full pitmaster lineup in about, uh, I think, another month or so, and, and tickets will be going on sale. But it's going to be quite an impressive uh, lineup. I think we have people from New York, from California, from Texas, from Florida, so it's going to be a, a really good event. So really, really looking forward to that. And it's something we, we – well, we started trying to do it two years ago, and, of course, COVID put things on hold last year, so this is going to be the inaugural outing uh but but really looking forward to that and 
So we'll, we'll have more details coming out later this summer. And that is November the 13th of this year. 13th, at, yep, which at, is a Saturday. At the Bend in North Charleston, South Carolina. It's going to be, this is, I think, I think Robert, it's more than just a local event. This is going to be a regional event. And, of course, Chattanooga is in the in the Charleston regional area. A lot of people vacation <laughs> there from Chattanooga. No, they do. For sure. I mean, there, there are a lot of people head down there and, and vacation. There. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. If you're heading to the beach, that's the ideal yeah. time to do it. And it'll be, uh, you know, all afternoon event. Probably, I don't know exactly what time it'll start. Start sometime 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, run until about sundown. But if you want to head down for a long weekend at the beach, or you know, it's an ideal, ideal thing to do in November. And, and the beaches here are really nice in November. It's not not so hot, but definitely not cold uh, yet at that time of year. I have never been to Charleston, but this is going to be my first visit because I'm coming. I'm heading down. <laughs> you are in. For, you're in for a treat, and we're really looking forward to, to getting you down here. Well, I can't. I can't wait. That's November the 13th. All right, let's talk a little bit. Of, let's talk a little bit about my, about my favorite thing: barbecue history. Um, I was listening to a podcast a few weeks ago with you and another gentleman, and it was one of the more interesting interesting topics that I've, I've heard about barbecue in a long time, so I just wanted to plagiarize that interview and use it as my own, okay, if that's okay with you. And, uh, yep, uh, works, we're we're works talking about the history Hopefully of barbecue. I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll have the same answers. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, go, we'll check the tape and go back and compare. But um, with the 4th of July coming up, and I guess, um, you know, Memorial Day has got its own barbecue vibe because it's kind of the kickoff, especially this mm-hmm. year. It was kind of like the unofficial reopening of America. And uh, the 4th of July this year, I think, is going to be it's, it's going to be huge because, number one, it's on a Sunday, and everybody will take off Monday. And so we kind of get a twofer on that one. And uh, I think everybody's going to enjoy that. But I- explain to everyone the history of barbecue and the 4th of July and especially the period after the civil war because robert you talk about you talk about things in your book that are going on right now that were have been going on in other places for for decades not just years i'm talking decades i'm talking like juneteenth yeah. we think that that's a new thing mm-hmm. that's not a new thing is it oh no not not at all and um you know yeah everything you know everything old is new again for sure i mean we we think about barbecue in the fourth of july these days i I think a lot of people associate with both for backyard cookouts but that's a really big day for uh people to go to barbecue restaurants and get takeout and do picnics and that that kind of thing um so we we definitely associate barbecue with fourth of july but i didn't realize until i started doing the research for the book just how far back in in history fourth of july barbecues go in fact it goes back to the very beginning almost of, of the of the country so from very early on, um, you know, after the American Revolution, decade after the American Revolution, um, people would celebrate with dinners, and this got bigger and bigger. They moved outdoors, and then by 1800, um, giant outdoor barbecues were really the the sort of standard way to celebrate the Fourth of July, particularly in the South. And um, you know, I found all these new pa- newspaper accounts from the you know 1800s, 1810s. All these big outdoor barbecues, and by big we mean hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Yeah. It'd be a gathering for an entire county, um, coming from from all around. It'd be outdoors, free to all. Of course, this is back before refrigeration, so uh, they would bring whatever animals they're going to cook, which are usually donated by local farmers. They bring them to wherever the barbecue is going to be, slaughter them right there, dig big pits in the ground, and and cook them up. Um, and so it was, a, it was a way to get together and celebrate the Fourth of July. Um, and I think it's important to the later story that you're talking about post Civil War, just how entrenched in American political culture that these these barbecues were, and they became very standardized very quickly. Um, by the 1820s, you read these new p- newspaper accounts; they're almost like a boilerplate or a template. <laughs> Everyone was this, almost the same. It just became this sort of ceremony. People would gather from all around a county, you know, so hundreds if not thousands of people they would line up into a long procession with the local militia and they would march to the county courthouse or maybe a maybe a church that's somewhere central they'd have a, the local band be playing patriotic songs and they have a big speech or oration by a, a prominent citizen about you know patriotism and celebrating fourth of july yeah. and then when all that sort of stuff was over they'd march off to the shady grove where the barbecue was waiting and uh start eating and so it was uh, a you know that, it was a real time to bring the entire community together for celebrations to sort of 
talk about the principles of the revolution and independence and, and liberty and, and, and all that kind of thing and build community and, and build a sense of patriotism in the uh, early United States. It, it, it was like a uh, like a political gathering, I, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, I think um, you, you mentioned not, that there not, were political not, speeches or uh, toasts made, political toasts. Some... Yeah, oh, absolutely. It, it, actually, it, it, it was not these, – these early events were not – tame there was lots of booze floating around a lot of whiskey and a lot of uh, brandy and and those types of things but yeah it was the standard thing to do at the end of the of the after every finished eating was to do to rounds of toasts and there always would be 13 what they call regular toasts representing the 13 american colonies and the stripes and the flag and which would be you know people would be selected to, to do those and then those would be followed by what they call volunteer toasts where anybody from the crowd could stand up and toast you know george washington or liberty or whatever they wanted to toast and the newspapers would actually print the toast and sometimes there's dozens of the volunteer toasts so you can only imagine that people were pretty well toasted uh, by the end of, of all that so it was sort of a civics kind of thing you know toasting liberty sometimes political statements made in the toast and before long the well, politicians started showing up to these because they realized that you know, long before TV, radio, anything like that, the best way to get in front of a huge crowd of people and give a speech was to go to one of these Fourth of July barbecues. So that's actually where the stump speech uh, came from. They've been, the term stump speech literally refers to jumping up on a stump mm -hmm. that had been cleared in one of these groves because the barbecue is actually always held uh, in a shady grove because it was Fourth of July in the South with no air conditioning. Um, and they would cut down trees and you have stumps around that you could jump up on and and uh, make a speech. So that was sort of very early on became just you know part of the, the political culture of, of the United States. The, um, of course, you know we always associate the Fourth of July now with just a, a family picnic. But but the, but the Fourth of July um, go through the twenties and the thirties, eighteen twenties, thirties up to the Civil War, mm -hmm. and then uh, post Civil War, and then all of a sudden the uh, the Fourth of July barbecue becomes a almost a political football doesn't it yeah absolutely and what what happened is right you know of course <clears throat> when the south seceded and, and uh, try, tried to leave the union the fourth of july ceased to be a, a yeah. holiday that was celebrated by white southerners in the book i actually uh, found this great account in washington georgia um where right after the, the war ended right after appomattox you know fourth of july was a couple months later and so there were federal troops stationed in Washington, Georgia, and um, you know, so the occupying federal troops. So the troops staged a Fourth of July barbecue, but the only people who came to it were all the African American, newly freed African American citizens from the from the uh, from the county, so where all the white citizens stayed away. And they actually tried to hold their own um, sort of counter protest Fifth uh, of July barbecue the day after, though that was wasn't too it was so hot it wasn't very uh, effective. But that was sort of what happened in the South in the decades following the Civil War is white Southerners did not celebrate the Fourth of July, but African-American Southerners did. And it became very much one of the central um, uh, central sort of celebrations in the African-American community. You mentioned Juneteenth, which is, you know, just got passed into a national holiday. And I think people have been reading about it you know, and will know that that was – um, the day that General Granger arrived in Texas, and with the arrival of federal troops, they could finally put into effect the Emancipation Proclamation. So it represents the days the last Americans were freed from, from right. slavery. Um, but in other parts of the South, the basically the Emancipation Proclamation took place on Gen or took effect on January first, eighteen sixty-three. So in parts of the South, are occupied by federal troops, it went in place then. Other parts of the South, it went in, it went into effect whenever federal troops arrived. So here in Charleston, it was in, uh, I believe, February 1865 is when the you know, the federal troops uh, seized Charleston and, and, and were able to put it into place. So um, all throughout the South in the post-war era, there are two big celebrations in the African-American community. One was Emancipation Day, and that was usually actually on January 1st in a lot of states, and in April in, I think, Tennessee and, and Kentucky, just related to when you know, sort of when the emancipation was put into place. Um, and a barbecue was always the centerpiece of, of, of Emancipation Day. So straight through the, you know, the rest of the 19th century, Emancipation Day and the 4th of July were the two big, uh, or two of the biggest community events in the African-American community. And a barbecue was always 
you know, front and center for that, whereas Fourth of July was was not even, a, you know, commemorated by white Southerners, uh, at least until, for really 40 more years, up until the, um, during the Spanish-American War, when there was a, you know, the U.S. went to war against Spain, there was a wow. big revival of patriarch sentiment, and then everyone started <laughs> celebrating Fourth uh, of July again. So there's this sort of this, this period for 40 years where only half of the South really uh, celebrated Fourth of July. Uh, before we take the break, I'm going to read right here. The popularity of Juneteenth ebbed in the early 20th century as black Texans began to leave farms mm-hmm. and move into the cities. July 4th was already established as a civic holiday, and non-agricultural employers were less inclined than their rural counterparts to let employees take another day off on June 19th. The civil rights movement of the 60s sparked a revitalization of Juneteenth as many activists began to look back to the civic traditions of African American passed. In 1980, the the Texas legislator made June 19th an official state holiday, and it has since spread well beyond the borders of the Lone Star State. So we're kind of late to the party here, aren't we? Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I thought thought Juneteenth was something that was, seriously, was just brought up in the last two or three years, which which just shows my tremendous ignorance of history. Yep. Um, this thing's been yeah, around. Yeah, and it was yeah in Texas it was called Emancipation Day till almost the you turn of the 20th century so till till 1900, and then because it was on June 19th, which is the day that uh, emancipation arrived in in Texas, that sort of merged into this June, Juneteenth uh, day. So it's been around for you know since 1865. So a a very old holiday indeed. And, and and people listen. We're gonna take our we're gonna take our next break here. Just but people listen. Don't think this isn't a political discussion. This is this is a a discussion that the what runs common through all these different uh, celebrations. Jeff is barbecue. It's you mm-hmm. know it's it's you know let's have a barbecue. Whether it be pulling family together or political things, barbecue surrounds everything. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what's so amazing yep. about what we do. It, it's just it it just transcends every. Every race, every holiday, um, everybody's got a, uh, a favorite a favorite time of year or day to do a barbecue. Hey, stay with us. We're talking with Dr. Robert Moss, uh, author of Barbecue, the History of an American Institution, and we will be right back. 267-1023, 267-1023. If you have a comment or you want to talk to Robert or ask him a, a historical question, about a barbecue. Now's your chance. 267 1023 here on the Owl's Nest Barbecue Show live on Talk Radio 102.3. Yeah. <laughs> barbecue yep. makes the world go round. You still there, Robert? Yep, I sure am. Okay, good. Never then. know when, when I'm live. <laughs> yeah, no, no. We're off from. Tell you the music. Or we well, can... yeah, we're off. We're off radio. We're still live on Facebook. Oh, okay. That was a that was an interesting conversation. Yeah, it's a fascinating period. I mean, just the it's really true that um, just about every major civic event, you know, celebration in the in the South in the nineteenth century uh, involved barbecue at the center of it, whether it was. You know, Fourth of July, or um, you know, to this you know, to this day, elections or anything. To this day, when local when people run in the local uh, races, they will always come to me and say, "Hey, we're thinking about doing a barbecue fundraiser. Would you be interested in uh, doing the barbecue?" And um, and and normally those things they make a ton of money for candidates because you know somebody somebody will donate the meat. And um, yep. and the, you know they they put out the uh, the little bowl for the checks, and um, it's a uh, it's it, in the in the beer starts flowing and the barbecue starts flowing, and the the checks get written and the checks get bigger bigger and bigger <laughs> and bigger. It's it's funny speaking of writing checks. The back when they were building the railroads in the south, um, they that was the biggest way to raise funds raise sort of, sort of, they were selling subscriptions, which is basically shares in the railroad companies. And so you'd hold a big barbecue, get all the whiskey and beer flowing, and then after everybody was eating and, 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 and drunk their fill, then you open up the books and suddenly everybody starts subscribing, <laughs> thinks it's a real good idea and invest in the railroad. That is so funny. That is so funny. 
That is so funny. We come back. Well, um, if you know of any specific events around the Spanish-American War, something that maybe took notice or made people take notice, and uh, yeah, I really, I really don't. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. Let's see when? Spanish, yeah, I don't know. That, well, when was that? Eighteen ninety. Eighteen ninety-eight. I want to say eighteen ninety-eight, ninety-nine. Isn't that the war where Roosevelt charged the hill? Isn't that yeah. the Rough Riders? Yeah. So yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so like Puerto Rico and the yeah. Philippines were sort of where mm-hmm. it played out, and that's how the U.S. you know sort of well got got Puerto Rico as a territory, and, and for a while the Philippines was the, was the territory. Well, we know. But uh, San Juan know, Hill was yeah, where well, we know Theodore the Roosevelt was a big was a big barbecue guy. Yep, for sure, and uh, his. Successor, who was his vice president, William Howard Taft, was a huge barbecue guy as well, and he was actually the governor of the Philippines before he became president. And uh, I didn't know that. I haven't written it up yet, but there's some great barbecue events that he went to in Georgia right after he got elected president. Before he took office, he sort of for those who think about it, we'll, 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 we'll get a preview. G O W F M. Talk Radio 102.3. Hey, we're back. Hey, we're back. The Owl's Nest Owl's Barbecue Owl's Show live here on Talk Radio 102.3. We're talking with author Robert Moss. Barbecue, the history of an American institution among the many books he has scripted. Uh, he's the king and he reigns supreme at the Owl's Nest Barbecue Supply. Myron Mix and Rubs and Sauces set the pace for your backyard cookout. Myron is the winningest man in barbecue. And also the the current uh, world champion from Memphis in May, and he wants to be part of your backyard team too. So team up with Jack's Old South, and get your Meyer mixing products at the Owls Nest Barbecue Supply in Ultawa. Our number is two six seven one zero two three. If you want to get on the line and ask Dr. Robert Moss, the historian of barbecue, a question like a "What if?" or "Have you ever heard of?" And at the break, we were talking about um, fast forwarding to the uh, Spanish American War when. Um, I guess I guess Robert, that's when the South um, got over themselves and started um, celebrating the Fourth of July again. Yeah, two things it, it happened. Um, one was there was this sort of period of reconciliation, and, and actually in the book there's a there was this giant barbecue. I think it was in 1895. It was um, there was an organization called the Grand Army of the Republic, which the GAR which was the Union sort of Veterans Association. And they staged this giant barbecue in Kentucky and invited all the Confederate uh, soldier uh, veteran organizations to come there. And it was actually uh, Gus Jobert, who was the barbecue and burgoo king of Kentucky, cooked. And there were almost 100,000 uh, people in attendance, Whoa. so maybe the largest barbecue ever uh, in, in, in the U.S., but it was the theme was reconciliation of between the Union and and the Confederate troops, and of course by that point it was forty years after the, the end of the war, so most of the the veterans were, were old men at, at that point, um, and so there was a lot of other things going on. But there's sort of a reconcil- theme of reconciliation in the air, and then when the Spanish American War came, uh, which I believe 1898, um, you know, a few years later, I think at that point you had a surge of you sort of patriotic fervor in the South because you know the U.S. was at war. And uh, that sort of led to everybody starting to wave the the stars and stripes again and going to Fourth of July, you know, celebrating Fourth of July with barbecues. Hey, and, hey Robert, hold on. And, we've got other we, events. Robert, we got a caller on line one. We got Juan on line no. one. Go ahead, Juan. Uh, g- good evening, gentlemen. Uh, I'm thoroughly enjoying the discussion and the historical uh, facts. Um, two two things. First, Steve, is there should we be calling you? Um, I don't know, coach or maestro or I mean, is doctor professor? Is there a title that that you must adhere to for this show? Oh and, and yes, your yes, it is. I am a smokeologist. Okay, yeah, that I, is, I am. I, I'm a I'm a smokeologist. Don't encourage yeah. him. Don't Smoke, encourage okay. him. He doesn't need it. Go, All right, very go, good. Go um, on, my friend. <laughs> To, to your esteemed guest, uh, in all seriousness, the what types of meat were most prevalently used during you know the, these historical events? I mean, we're, we're I, we all know you know kind of in the South it was always pig and 
Texas, I mean, at least nowadays, you know, it's it's beef. Um, but, I mean, did, did they use sheep or goat or beef, pork? I mean, what what were the more prevalent cuts and, and ways of um, preparing this? Yeah. Well, the answer to all, to all that is yes. Uh, and that's the really interesting thing about 19th century barbecue is that, yeah, we think of, you know, pork as, as Carolina's today and, and beef as Texas. But in the 19th century, it was everything went on the on the barbecue pit. And these, um, you know, up until the 20th, early 20th century, there weren't restaurants. People weren't really cooking barbecue to sell it. These were free community events that were staged by the community. So the farmers would donate just whatever they had on hand. And these were huge events, you know. So you're cooking for thousands of people. The list of animals that were served and the, and the number and the, and, the, and the pounds is actually just amazing from the, from this period. So you would see, no matter whether you're in Texas, you know, Tennessee, the Carolinas, Virginia, you would see barbecues with pigs, goats, sheep, oftentimes a whole you know, whole steer split split in half, um, chickens, a lot of game. You see venison uh, put in the pit. So. Um, but sheep or, or mutton uh, l- l- and lamb were actually really common uh, barbecue meats throughout the 19th century and well into the 20th century. It started to fade out right after World War II. But the, the, the short answer is just about anything on four legs uh, or with wings would end up on, on the pit. Well, uh, it's interesting. I was having a discussion with a gentleman at work the other day about um, iguanas and, and how um, – they're they're moving into Florida. They I don't know if they're in mm-hmm. the country there yet, but they're a you know a, a non-native and invasive species. I hear they're quite tasty. Um, and uh, Steve, do you have any good recipes for iguana? <laughs> no, but I know who does. I, and this is no joke. There is a there is a a barbecue person. Her name is Robin Linders. Lindars, L-I-N-D-A-R-S. Robert, you may know her, Robin. Um, it's um, it's grill. What is it? Grill. It's grill. The Grill Girl is, is what she goes by, and she's got a website, grillgirl.com, and she has published iguana recipes. She lives in Florida, and she hunts these rascals, and she. This is the truth. She eats them. And, and you're right, Juan. They are tasty, according to her. I have not seen I've one had yet. I some in Puerto Rico, and it was darn good. Mm-hmm. It really was. It was like served with a mango chutney. It was smoked meat. I mean, it was delicious. I will take your now word for that. I had gator, and, and that was pretty good. So I, I figure if gator is pretty good, then the guana is probably in the same ballpark. But well, you, this gentleman I met, he has a place in Costa Rica. And he says the natives there call it the pollo de arbor, which is the chicken of the trees. Yep. And um, they apparently it's some pretty good meat. Maybe we'll get some uh, get some of those rascals uh, you know, around Tennessee, and we can get a hunting permit for well, them. And we've we've got know. alligators. I mean, we've got alligators up here now. So why not iguanas? Yeah. It's a party right. here in Tennessee. Sure. See, see what no income tax gets you, folks. You get alligators, well, iguana. It's great. Okay, Juan, thank you so much. Uh, good, good question there, Robert. And uh, I tell you what, let's take a real quick break. We come back, more talk. I want to talk about um, the um, William, uh, President Taft and his barbecue tour of Georgia before he was president. Okay, we'll do. And there's a possum in the story, so that will be a, uh, that a makes good... it even better. Iguanas <laughs> and possums, folks. You don't hear this stuff on Sport Talk, <laughs> no, sir, Reed, Bob. You don't hear this in the morning. When when one of the morning hosts said that that chicken wings were white meat, I mean that's what you that's what you got to put up with in the morning on the morning show here on WGOW. See on WGOW, you got to come for the truth. You got to come Friday nights at seven to the Allison's Barbecue Show. We'll be right back. Stay with us. That was a great question by that fellow. Yeah, it was really good. The first one or the second one? All of them. <laughs> the guy knew. The guy knew his barbecue. He knew his geography too. People that know geography yeah, my, always amaze me. My favorite favorite one of barbecue is the one in in Oklahoma City. 
in the 1920s where uh, when Jack Walton got inaugurated as governor, um, he had a, not as quite as big as that Grand Army of the Republic, but he had a huge barbecue uh, in you know at, at the fairgrounds in Oklahoma City. I'm trying to find the list. The list of animals that went on the pit is is quite amazing. Uh, it, all kinds of stuff from like you know uh, bears and possums and raccoons. And somebody uh, shot some reindeer way up north and shipped them in. And so they actually barbecued reindeer at the uh, Oklahoma. Oh my God! Uh, barbecue. <laughs> so it's um, quite amazing. I wonder if it's on page two hundred five and two hundred six. Robert, you wrote this book, and I just cannot. I, can, I just I skip through it and read interesting things that are in it. I tell you, folks, listen here on Facebook. If you don't have this book, if you're interested in all about barbecue, and if you don't have this book, you're you're really missing out. Uh, yep. Let's see. Yeah, you, I, I found it. it's on two hundred two. So the list is. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't even include the you know, thousands of, of cows, you know, pigs, sheep, and chicken. But there's 103 turkeys. 1,363 rabbits, 26 squirrels, 134 opossums, 113 geese, five deer, two buffalo, and two reindeer shipped in for the north. That's that's a bunch of food. Yeah. Especially, in, as guy especially in Oklahoma. I'd say bear. back then there weren't a lot of people oh, no. in Oklahoma. <laughs> Some guy caught a bear and was going to donate. It was live. He was going to donate it to the cause. But all the school children in Oklahoma City sort of felt sorry for the bear, so they pulled all their lunch money and, and bought the bear from the guy and donated him to the local zoo. And so he was like a favorite. Uh, oh, that's cool. Sort of a you know, creature at the zoo. So at least one of the animals didn't uh, didn't go on the pit there. See, these, these stories are interesting. This is interesting radio. This, this is very interesting radio. It's a lot better than Howard Stern. Ha! <laughs> Robert, maybe we'll, maybe we'll get picked up by uh, Sirius Radio or something like that. Hey, you know, I'm just I'm I'm just waiting for their call. I'm sure it's coming anytime now. You could you could use me as a partner, couldn't you? I got the equipment. <laughs> oh, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> See how quick I did ditched right there? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I got thrown at the curb so fast. Write a book. Write a book. I'll bring you along. If I could write. Just write a book's all you gotta do. I'll talk to you if you write a book. You know, Robert, you ought to put this book out on um audio. You ever thought about you know, that? No, actually, there is. It, the original version Hot is audio book. Your afternoon oh. drive destination. Sport Talk. Talk 1023. Talk Radio 102.3. All right. Welcome back, all you pellet heads out there. You know your pellet smoker needs a quality fuel at the Owl's Nest Barbecue Supply. We stock barbecuers delight pellets that will keep your smoker running smoothly with great flavor. Everything from mesquite, oak, hickory, cherry. You can trust Barbecuer's Delight pellets to stoke your smoker with flavor and dependability. Our guest today, Dr. Robert Moss, author of Barbecue, the History of American Institution. Okay, William Howard Taft, Teddy Roosevelt's vice president, I guess, and when Roosevelt decided not to run, I guess, uh, Governor Taft, is that, would that be his correct? Um, well, it. He was originally uh, Judge Taft, is what they called him. He was a federal judge, and then he. Be, uh, but before that, uh, he was the governor of the Philippines mm -hmm. uh, when the U.S. occupied the Philippines after the, the Spanish American War. And then he became uh, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, vice president. And then when Roosevelt decided not to run again, uh, he was sort of Roosevelt's handpicked successor and was elected president in uh, 1908 and took office in 1909. And he did a barbecue tour of Georgia. Now, tell us about that. He, yeah, and then, and uh, I think it, back in those days, um, the president was still inaugurated in March. So after mm -hmm. he got elected, they, he and his family went and, and spent the summer in uh, Augusta, Georgia, and uh, stayed down there at a at sort of a golf resort, early one of the early golf resort kind of things. And while he was there, everybody, all the little towns in Georgia invited him to come to a barbecue, and he only accepted a couple of them. He accepted uh, one in um, in Augusta at, uh, at sort of a local politico's uh, farm outside of Augusta, and he accepted another one with the Beach Island Farmers Club, which is right across the river in, uh, in South Carolina. But the most interesting thing is that he got uh, – he had heard about possum and uh, a barbecue possum dinner 
uh, was staged because he had asked about it in Atlanta. And so all across uh, Georgia, this call went out for hunters to um, provide possum for the feast. And so they basically made this giant feast with, uh, you know, hundreds of sort of prominent Georgians invited to it uh, for the big possum supper, uh, where he's going to eat, uh, roasted possum and sweet potatoes was the, was the meal. Mm. And by all accounts, it was a big hit. Uh, and they, they procured all these big, big possums. <laughs> Funny you know, thing and, out we, of that. and we laugh at, we laugh at, uh, at possums now eating possum is, is, is a funny thing now. But, um, back then it was also a, uh, a, a favorite on the Christmas menu at the white house. Yes. Uh, many, many it was times. considered a delicacy for for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, and they wrote, and they used to raise them. They raised some of them on these special farms. I think I, I was. Yeah. I'm 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 channeling uh, Adrian Miller now, one of my other favorite <laughs> barbecue authors. And uh, I think he said they raised them as a a special kind of animal, a special possum. It wasn't the road. Yeah, slick. they would. It they wasn't would the road slick possum woods, we're thinking. But then of. they would yeah feed them, uh you know sort of put them in pens and and fatten them up on. You know, clean feed so they would be fat and tasty instead mm-hmm. of they tasting the like whatever they would A-9 eat. A nine version of possum. <laughs> yeah, the A <laughs> nine brisket version. <laughs> Robert, <laughs> we're right. gonna we're gonna have to get out of here. Thank you so much for being on the show again. You are a uh, uh, always a a pleasure to talk with, and always uh, interesting. You kind of class up the joint, and uh, as <laughs> they say, and I look forward to seeing you. And of course, we'll talk to you again before November the thirteenth. But um, if you're in the Charleston area, make sure or you make plans. For November the thirteenth, and what is the name of the um, of the? Um, it's, it's called it's called Holy Smokes, a Holy Low Smokes. Country Barbecue Festival, and that will be uh, November the thirteenth in North Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, I will be there. Now, Robert, put me on standby, okay? If one of those, oh yeah, you're definitely if, on the if the Rod, list. If, I, we, know, uh, if, if, if Rodney we, Scott we bails on you, out, we're, we're calling you. Yeah, you know, go to the bullpen. I, you know, I got no problem. Mind, I got no problem going to the pen, being Rodney Scott's reliever. Okay, <laughs> and um, you know, I, don't worry. I can I can do as just as good a job as Rodney Scott. I promise. <laughs> He'll, he'll come out of the pen like goose gossage, nothing but heat. That's right. <laughs> Robert, thank you so much. We're going to let you go. And everybody listening here in Chattanooga, we've got to get back to the pit because we've got a 140-pound pig there that needs to be tended to. And uh, we want to make sure the temperature is just right. Come see us tomorrow at noon at Cambridge Square at Ryan Hargrove's, Ryan Hargrove's place, uh, Hop Town Beer Bar, and we'll see you there tomorrow. Joe, thank you so much. Everyone in Chattanooga, good night and good luck.